I love music. I love music. In particular, I love black music. Black music is special to me because it is the, it is the soundtrack of my youth. It is the music to which I grew up. It's the music I fell in love with. Um, when I grew up over the, the Atlantic, on the other side of the Atlantic, my two brothers, they were both older than me, and they had piles of vinyl of African-American music. So everything from funk to R&B to soul to hip hop. My two brothers supplied me with just the most beautiful black music. But one of the reasons I like black music the most is that it led me to my career. It led me to an understanding of how you can take music to understand who we are as black people. I'm an ethnomusicologist, so that means I study music and culture. I'm really interested in what music tells us about who we are as black people, not only here in the United States, but in Africa and around the world. And so I, I charge my, my students to study music as if they're studying a text. Look at the music, really listen, and try to figure out what does this music tell us about who we are as human beings. Love music. And so lately, I've been thinking about this song by Stevie Wonder. It's a song called A Place in the Sun. It's a song I love very much. It, it comes to mind at, at, at all times. And it's a song that he recorded in 1966. He was a 16-year-old, young, blind, black man in Detroit. And so as he sang these lyrics, a place in the sun where there's hope for everyone, he talks about reaching for a dream, moving on, moving on. He talks about reaching for the ideal to be free, moving on, moving on. And so you, you wonder, what does this mean to a young black man in Detroit in 1966? What is this aspect of freedom that he's talking about? I don't think it's, it's a stretch to think that as Stevie Wonder belts out that song as a 16-year-old, he's thinking about what is going on in the United States at that time. The civil rights movement is in full blow. Black power, full. So this young boy is just really thinking about this as he's singing this song. He also references here a dream. What is that dream he's talking about? Is it a stretch to think that he's making reference to a dream that was mentioned three years earlier in Martin Luther King's great I Have a Dream speech in 1963? In that speech, Dr. King said, he, he dreamt of a world, a nation, where his children would be judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. That was the dream Dr. King talked about. That was the dream that Stevie Wonder was singing about three years later. So as we think of, of that dream, the question comes up. In 2016, have we attained the dream? Are we there yet? I believe that there are many people who would say that we still have a long way to go. There are so many things that have happened over the past few years that tell us, that remind us that we still have so much work to do. So this afternoon, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about two groups of, of people. I want to speak specifically to one group of, of people. Recently, a number of people have uh, referenced um, the pattern of young black people who have been killed. There have been all kinds of, of discourse around that. And no, a, a number of us think about this as a point where we can talk about um, the ways in which people are judged on the, on the color of, of their skin. There are two group, groups of, of people who respond to that discourse. The first group, I'll call them the vocal minority. Those are the people we typically hear on certain news networks who um, are very vocal. I'm not bothered with, with, with them. I'm more bothered with what I'll call the silent majority. Those are the people who have good hearts but are not stepping up. They ask 
very interesting questions about the situation. And these are questions that perplex me sometimes. So that's the group I wanted to talk to. When we think about this place in the sun that Stevie Wonder was, was singing about, where there's hope for everyone, I think about that sun. How do we get there? And how will it be when we're there? Will we just like bask in, in the sun and just have a really good time? And so I'm going to pause and ask you, how many of you get sunburned when you bask in the sun? Wow, OK. So a number of you feel it. I don't. My hand did not go up. This skin does not get burned when I'm in the sun. However, I will not doubt that it hurts you when you're in, you're in the sun. Apparently, it really hurts. This is my friend April. Oh, I know. <laughs> April had spent some time on a beach somewhere, having a good time, forgot her sunscreen. This is what happened. I asked her, April, how did this feel? She said, Stephanie, it hurt. <laughs> it peeled, sometimes it pusses. I mean, ugh, horrible. I don't know, I've never experienced it. Never. But I'm not going to say to April, stop complaining, get over it. I'm not going to do that. I don't walk in, in her skin. She doesn't walk in mine. I'll believe what she says about the experience of being white in the sun. So when I hear this, race is not an issue. Stop complaining. It bothers me. Because if you're not in this skin, you will not understand what that, that experience and that journey is like, right? Here's another image. Three, three sets of feet, pairs of feet. This is me, my brother, and my sister. We were in Togo last summer. Togo is a small country in West Africa where the beautiful, the beautiful big sun is hot all the time. We were taking a drive, and we we were driving by the beach and we said, let's stop, get out and just walk. And we did. We didn't have to stop and get sunscreen. We didn't have to think about, oh, go oh goodness, the sun is so high, it, is, it will burn us. We just got out and we had a good time. We are privileged. I recognize that I don't have to spend money on some of those, those products. I can just get out and, and have a, a good time. So. It perplexes me when I hear people say, I'm not particularly privileged in this country where race has been constructed for hundreds of years and where we're still dealing with the aftermath of this history. There are people who owned other people, right? We're far from that, but the, the ripple is still here. So when you say you're not, pri you're not privileged, I understand that there are other ways in which you may not be privileged, maybe in the pocket, maybe educationally, but in terms of whiteness and blackness, there is privilege that should be acknowledged. This is Jamie. Jamie takes care of himself. He gets his sunscreen, but this particular time he got one that sprays. And apparently, when you spray it, you got to rub it in, apparently, right? He complained. I will not tell him, Jamie, it happened once. Be quiet. Let's move on. Often, in the past few months, I've heard people ask me, well, how many times will you call the N-word? Five times? Well, it's just five times. It won't happen again. Again, I'm not going to tell Jamie it happened once, because it happened before, I know. And if Jamie does this again, it will happen again. So let's not say, let's not say it only happened one time. Get over it. You just saw her. My next friend. I have lots of white friends. <laughs> this is Mary Beth. We work in the same office. We wanted to go out and enjoy the, the sun. It's been a long winter. 
And as we were going out, she said, wait, I need to go back and get my stuff. I wanted to go out so bad, but she had to, we had to wait, spend like five minutes. She got her hat out, she got the cream, rubbed it in, and I was waiting and the, and the, and the time was ticking. <laughs> but once we got there, we enjoyed it, right? We both sat there and we enjoyed it. So, do both these lives matter? Yes. But one matters a little bit, bit more in this context. So, when young black people, old black people, middle-aged black people say that black lives matter, understand, it doesn't mean that yours doesn't. All it means is that in this particular case, ours are mattering a little bit more in 2016 in this country with this history. It's unique to the United States. So black lives do matter. Another thing is this. As Mary Beth, Jamie, and April stop to get their stuff for our journey to the sun, right? There are shelves of sunscreen at Walgreens, Walmart, right? There's SPF 30, there's SPF 12, there's SPF 50, there's F SPF 60, there's the spray, there's the bronzer, right? There are all kinds of SPFs. In fact, I was gonna call this talk WTF SPF, <laughs> right? Because I don't understand it. I don't understand it. But I'm not going to stop and tell the manager at the Walgreens that this is special treatment and you should get rid of it. It's taking up too much space. Similarly, I get so bothered when I hear that African Americans don't need special treatment. They don't need an office that deals particularly with their experiences. They don't need a black culture center. It bothers me because of the experience of being black, right? And, the, and, the, and that experience is very personal to me. I understand it may not be personal to you, my second group, my, my silent majority, but what I'm trying to say here is that we should start really rethinking the kinds of, of ideas that come to mind that you feel are not harmful, but in the, in, in the large scope, of, scope of, of things could be quite harmful. If the manager were to get rid of that whole uh, shelf, people would be really in pain, right? If Mary Beth asks me to go in and get her SPF 30, and I get her SPF 5, apparently, that has not helped her, <laughs> right? So there's a particularity that has to go, an intentionality that has to go into these, um, solving these problems. And there are many others. For example, talking about race drives a deeper wedge. But if we don't talk about it, it just sits there and it festers. Why should I have to relinquish my privilege is another one that comes up quite often. And I'm not saying that, that you should. I don't want to give up the privilege of this beautiful brown, right? I want to be able to stop and go to the beach anytime I want. So I don't want to give that up. All I'm saying is that could we find a way to make everybody privileged enough to enjoy that sun? And then the last one, which, which I, I would argue is the most dangerous, which is I don't see color. Uh, we're all the same. That's dangerous. Because if we say we don't see color, what will happen is that we will go to the default, which is not black in this society. So please see color. Please see mine. This deep brown is a reflection of a history that is deep, rich, and beautiful that includes West Africa and the West Indies. Acknowledge that. When Martin Luther King said he didn't want a world that judged his, his children on the color of their skin, he was talking about judgment. He wasn't talking about acknowledgement or appreciation. Appreciate the color of the skin, but don't judge it. Instead, judge the content of character. And so this afternoon, I want to encourage us, especially that, that second group, I love you and you know who you are. 
that the way to judge, to find the content of character, particularly for black people, the music. For example, in 1967, Marvin Gaye sang a song called What's Going On. In there, he acknowledges that there, there's far too many of us dying. He's telling a story there. Two years later, Nina Simone takes a song called Young, Gifted, and Black, which was written by Lorraine Hansberry. And in this song, she's saying, there's a great truth that you should know. What is that truth? In 88, NWA wrote a song called F the Police. I know we don't like it, but a young bleep bleep got it bad because I'm brown and not the other color. What are they talking about here, about the experience of living in Compton as a young black man? In 2015, Kendrick Lamar comes out with a song that's called We Gonna Be All Right, which has become the anthem for the movement, for the contemporary movement. This song says, and let me tell you about my life. Let's find out what Kendrick is talking about. Let's not dismiss it. And of course, Super Bowl 50, lots of con controversy because Beyonce sang a song called Formation, but within the lyrics of that song, she's talking about her father who's from Alabama, her mother's from Louisiana. You mix that Negro with the Creole, makes a Texas mama, right? This is the diversity of, of black life. These are all clues to the content of character for African Americans. So as we end, I want you to think about this. A, a place in the sun was written by one of only two white men who were working for Motown in 1966. So it is possible to move from the silent majority to actually becoming someone who can vocalize what that experience is and understand it. Also, this man, Ronald Norman Miller, wrote a song called Heaven Help Us. He said, heaven help the black man who struggles one more day, and heaven help the white man who turns his, his back away. That is a song that was also written by the white man who wrote for Stevie Wonder. So as we close, let's not be that man who turns his back away. Let's all acknowledge, appreciate, learn. All this is accessible. It's a click away, and maybe we will all get there to a place in the sun where there's truly hope for everyone. Thank you.